Today we're starting Unit 5 in Biology 102, which is Anatomy and Physiology Part 2, and this is going to be on the lymphatic system and the immune system. So looking here at this salad bar, it's kind of a representation of your body. If you think of all the different types of cells that are on your body and in your body, a lot of those are actually going to be used for some type of food source or energy source for other organisms. These are going to be microorganisms that are going to be living on your body and within your body. There's actually around 30 trillion microorganisms that are going to live on and within the human body. And they're going to eat or feed on different parts of the body. Some of those cells will actually help us out. Some of them are going to be symbiotic. Some of those actually uh, will help make things that we need, such as vitamin K in the large intestine. That's going to be made from E. coli. Then, of course, there's going to be some of those that could actually cause us to become sick or ill. The first microorganism that you see on the left-hand top corner is going to be Helorobacter pylori. This bacteria is actually going to be found within the human digestive system. It's going to line the intestines and it will actually eat away at the tissue that's there. Another type of microorganism that can enter the body will be a type of virus. The one that you see here on the top right-hand side is actually going to be the Ebola virus. This virus is... it actually comes into the body. It's not going to eat part of the body, but what it does do is it takes over the machinery and the mechanisms of the cell once it gets into the cell, and it causes the cell to make and reproduce more and more of that type of virus, and it does make people very sick. Now with this one, the Ebola is going to attack the cells that line the blood vessels and are going to be in the circulatory system. And so basically what they'll do is not eat away at those cells if it's a virus, but it attacks those cells and it will actually kill those cells in the process of making more of that virus. Down at the lower left-hand corner, you see a type of fungus that's often found on the body. This one's actually going to be athlete's foot, and so that one's going to infect the foot, and it could overgrow on the feet and cause itching and irritation and redness to the feet. Over on the right-hand bottom corner, you see trypanosoma. That's going to be actually a type of protist. With this protist, this is one that causes African sleeping sickness, but there's going to be a whole host or range of other types of protists that can infect the body. Things such as tapeworms or even giardia, stuff like that, that can be found in water that people drink or in food that people eat. And so different types of microorganisms that can infect the body. We've talked about, we have bacteria, viruses, funguses or fungi, and protists. Here we're going to see some more protists. All of these are going to be on the um, side that are going to be more what's referred to as a parasite. You've got your hookworms, you have ascaris, which are a type of roundworms, and then of course you're going to have your flatworms like the tapeworm and flukes. So all of these are going to be things that can infect humans as well as other animals. Now other types of organisms that are going to be kind of parasitic to humans and other animals are going to be things such as chiggers, fleas, lice, ticks, and mosquitoes. Now all of these are going to actually feed on the blood of human beings and other animals as well as sometimes carry microorganisms in their saliva or in their mouth so when they bite the person they could also transfer these different types of illnesses or even parasites into a human being or into an animal and cause other types of microorganism illnesses. So in introduction with this lymphatic system and immunity, we're going to first talk about the pathogens. Pathogens are going to be microscopic organisms that cause disease. So this could be anything from those viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Each one of these is going to attack its host in a specific way. Now with the lymphatic system, sometimes you might see it depending on what text you're using as referred to as the lymphoid system. Its main job is to protect us against disease. The job of the lymphatic system is to help pr protect us and respond to things such as environmental pathogens, uh, toxins we may come across, 
abnormal body cells such as cancerous cells and it's going to do this with a specific type of cell and this cell is referred to as a lymphocyte. So that's actually going to be the cells that are going to be part of the immune system and their job is going to be to identify, attack, and develop immunity to specific pathogens that it comes across. Now, immunity is going to simply be the ability to resist infection and disease. So all body cells and tissues are involved in the production of immunity, not just the lymphatic system. So components of the lymphatic system, we're going to have lymph. Lymph is going to be the fluid that's similar to plasma, but it doesn't contain those plasma proteins. So if you're asked a question, what's the difference between plasma and lymph? It doesn't have the plasma proteins. So it is going to be similar, but without the proteins. Lymphatic vessels are going to be just like the vessels that carry blood. They do run along the um, veins and arteries, but instead they carry that lymph instead of the actual blood and blood components. And so they carry that lymph from the peripheral tissues and they're going to put it actually back into the veins and back into the venous system. Lymphoid tissues <clears throat> and lymphoid organs are going to be scattered throughout the body. Lymphoid cells are going to be things such as lymphocytes, phagocytes, and other cells that we'll find there. And so looking at this picture, you'll see in the picture you have different nodules. These are going to be your nodes. These different nodes are circular and notice how the lymphatic system is going to be shown here in green. And so going through you're going to have hundreds of these lymph nodes throughout the body and we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a minute. But notice how each part of the body has specific ones that are going to help clean out any infection that are going to be in that area. So cervical lymph nodes, cervic means neck, those are going to be the ones that you find in your neck. Then you have the thoracic duct. That thoracic duct is going to be very important as far as putting the lymph back into the venous system. You have the right lymphatic duct. That one also is going to be very important. You see the axillary lymph nodes. Those are going to be found underneath the arms and what is referred to as the armpits. You have them found in the mammary glands and that's going to service the tissue that's going to be found in the breast section. You have the cisterna chili that's going to be the ones that are going to help to service the um, abdominal cavity and the digestive organs. You have lymphatics of the upper limb that you see going down the arm region and lumbar lymph nodes, which you're going to find in the lower abdomen portion. Other lymphoid tissues and organs that you're going to have, you'll have tonsils, which we'll talk about in a minute. You're going to have the thymus, which is going to be a very important gland that's going to help um, T lymphocytes mature. You have the spleen, which is going to be important in filtering, and mucosal associated lymphatic tissue, which we often refer to as malt in the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. Looking at the lower portion of the body, the lymph nodes that you're going to see that are going to be some of the main ones, you'll have the pelvic lymph nodes. These are going to service everything in the pelvic region. You have the inguinal lymph nodes. These are going to be found in the areas where the legs come and attach to the main trunk portion of the body. And then you have the lymphatic system or lymph nodes of the lower limbs. Now, other lymph tissue and organs that are going to be found in this portion are going to be things such as the appendix, and we'll talk about that in detail, and the red bone marrow. The red bone marrow is going to be important because this is where all of your blood cells are going to be made. So not only your red blood cells, but this is also going to make those white blood cells, which will then contribute and turn into lymphocytes. So with the lymphatic vessels, these are going to begin as lymphatic capillaries, which are going to be closed on one end. These are not going to be open, such as the blood vessels or blood capillaries, where it comes in as arterial, goes through the capillary, and comes out as a venule. These are going to be closed in at one side, and then they're going to flow towards the other direction. So lymphatic capillaries are going to be located between cells of many of the different tissues. Lymphatic capillaries are going to merge from lymphatic vessels and then which those are going to have the thin walls and they're going to have many valves. So it's going to be kind of like veins. Veins had valves where arteries did not. They had a muscular structure. The same thing with lymph 
lymphatic vessels, these are also going to have valves. And that's going to keep um, this lymph from flowing backwards and collecting in tissues. So looking here, this is a picture of your regular capillaries. You notice how the oxygenated and nutrient blood is going to come through the arteriole. It comes through that center section, which you see changing over color. That is going to be the capillary. Once it delivers its oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide and waste, it then turns a bluish tint and then heads on through in the venule. Now with the arteriole, notice how it has lots of that smooth muscle around it. That's going to actually keep that blood flowing properly. And then with the venule, you do not have that. Instead, you're going to end up having valves that are going to help to keep any backflow from coming backwards. Over to the side, you're going to have your um, lymphatic capillary. And notice how it does have those rounded closed ends. And what it's doing is it's picking up any of the extra fluid in that interstitial tissue and putting it into that lymph vessel or that lymph capillary. From there, it's going to flow up towards the open ends and then it eventually will run through different valves in order to keep it from flowing backwards. So this is going to take out any excess um, fluid that's going to be found in these tissues. So here's another visual of what's going on. Of course, we have our blood flow that's coming down through the arteries. They turn into arterioles, which are going to be your smallest arteries. They'll then flow through into a capillary where they release their carbon, their oxygen and nutrients, pick up carbon dioxide and waste. And as they do that, it then turns into the venule. And then that venule flows back towards the veins and then back to the heart. Now through here, you have the interstitial fluid where you're going to have excess fluid that'll be flowing through these tissues and so that extra fluid is then going to be picked up by these capillaries and then it's going to flow through the lymphatic vessels and then eventually make its way back to the venous system. Over on the picture on the right hand side you see how this fluid is able to flow in and it's going to flow in through these different areas here that are open. Sorry messed up on the one up top, but as it flows in, it comes into this closed end capillary, which makes it different from the capillaries that you see on the left hand side. And it will then flow up with the lymph through the lymphatic system until it makes its way back to the venous system. And here's another picture showing you how the interstitial fluid can flow into these capillaries. It shows you that it does have blood vessels and capillaries near the tissue where it's going to be delivering nutrients, picking up waste, but then you have that interstitial fluid that's still going to be found in the tissues. And so that tissue is going to release that fluid into these lymphatic capillaries where it then can flow back with the lymph flow. So here's a picture of the lymph node. Now once the lymph is filtered out of that interstitial tissue, it goes into the lymph vessels and it's going to come in towards that lymph node from the afferent vessels that you see coming in. So as it comes in from the afferent vessels, any type of those microbes, microorganisms that are going to be there are going to come into this lymph node and they're going to be filtered out. It's going to be filled with thousands and thousands of phagocytic cells, macrophages, you're going to have B cells, T cells here that are going to be here to destroy and get rid of all of these microorganisms that do not belong. Once those microorganisms have been cleaned out and kind of filtered out of that lymph, then the lymph is going to exit that lymph node and it's going to come out through those efferent vessels. And you see those towards the top. Now notice with both the afferent and efferent vessels or efferent vessels, they both have valves and that keeps the lymph from flowing backwards. So it's a one-way valve. So it goes forward or goes up, but it cannot go backwards. These vessels don't have that same um, muscular structure that you'll find in things such as arteries, so they do have to have these valves like veins have in order to keep the fluids flowing in one direction. And so once it flows out of this lymph node, it's going to go through that efferent vessel, and then from there it's going to enter back into the venous system. So lymphatic nodules are going to be simply masses of lymphatic tissue that are not surrounded by a capsule. So this is a difference. These do not have a capsule. The lymph nodes do. 
So they're going to be scattered throughout the lamina propria of a muc mucous membrane, and that's going to line things such as the gastrointestinal area, the urinary section, and reproductive tracts and respiratory tract airways. So lymphatic nodules in these areas are also referred to as mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Lots of times it's referred to as malt, so that's what malt means. Here you're looking at a picture of a lymph node that's going to be in the neck of someone. If you go to the doctor and you're sick, lots of times they will check your lymph nodes to see if they're swollen. This is a good indication that these lymph nodes are working at filtering and cleaning out any type of microorganism or infection that might be in the body. And sometimes they swell to the point that you can see them. Now here's a picture showing how the lymphatic system runs along with the um, circulatory system and how it filters out and then brings that lymph or the fluid back into the venous system before it enters in through the superior vena cava. So from those lymphatic vessels, lymph passes through the lymph nodes and then into the lymph trunks. The lymph trunks are going to include the lumbar, the intestinal, the brachiomediastinal, the subclavian, and the jugular trunks. So lymph trunks then are going to be merged and they're going to form either into what's known as the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. And those are the last two stops before they come back into the venous system. All right, so looking here, you can see how with the venous system, how the lymphatic vessels will flow right along with those veins and then how they will come back in. And so you see that left subclavian trunk, and then you see the brachiocephalic veins. Notice how that um, left subclavian trunk comes in right there at that subclavian, um, brachiocephalic. Over at the right-hand side, notice that you see the, I'm sorry, it's the right-hand side, but on your left side, notice how the right subclavian vein comes in and you have that right internal jugular vein. So they come in and make the brachiocephalic veins. And so with those, notice how you have that right lymphatic duct coming in between those two sections there. And so that's gonna be bringing that lymph back into the venous system and putting the fluid back into the blood. And so here's just another visual showing you these two um, drainages or routes of drainage that come into the venous system. So basically the formation and flow of lymph, it comes from the interstitial fluid, which we discussed, goes through the lymphatic capillaries. From lymphatic capillaries, it goes to the lymph vessels, then to the lymph trunks, lymph ducts, and then subclavian veins. And so looking at the drainage, notice how the right side of the body using the right lymphatic duct only gets about a little less than a fourth of the drainage back into the venous system. The drainage of the thoracic duct is going to get a little more than three-fourths of the body. Next, we have tonsils. Tonsils are going to be lymphatic tissue that's going to help the immune system recognize pathogens. They're going to have crypts that capture debris that comes in through the mouth and the nose. So these pathogens, they're going to be caught in these crypts, and when they're caught in the crypts of those tonsils, the immune system is going to be able to recognize them. And so as it recognizes them or forms a memory, it's able to create things such as antibodies that are able to fight them. So as small amounts of these get into the crypts, the body becomes... Um, uh, used to them, the body learns them, the body make an makes antibodies, it is able to fight off these microorganisms, especially if larger amounts come in at another time. Sometimes people will end up with, with what's known as tonsil stones. And since these crypts are just basically small openings, they are likely to catch a lot of debris that's coming in from food, from drink. Also, you have to think about the pathogens or microorganisms that might be dying in these areas, along with the different body cells that could just be dying and being sloughed off from the body. So in these crypts, sometimes some people will have a buildup of all of these things and they'll create what's known as a tonsil stone. These tonsil stones lots of times are very foul smelling. They smell really bad. Uh, sometimes you can press on them with a q-tip or with a um, some type of 
wooden stick or something. And when you press on them, you can cause them to come out of their crypts. You can push them out of the crypts. And it's simply going to be a mixture of all these things. It could be food. It could be dead cells, dead pathogens, things like that. That's creating the tonsil stone. Some people are more likely to get tonsil stones than others. Some people will never have tonsil stones, and some people might get them throughout their life at different times. One thing you have to worry about with the throat and the immune system is strep throat. Strep throat is going to be a severe sore throat, but if it is not treated in time with antibiotics or treated properly, then it could actually cause damage with the valves inside of the heart. And so it's going to be important that you are diagnosed if with the strep throat and that you take an antibiotic in order to get rid of this bacteria that can damage your heart. So here's some warning signs. It has sudden and severe sore throat along with painful swallowing, a fever over 101, red and swollen tonsils with white patches, skin rashes or body aches. Lots of times the skin rash, if it's accompanying with the strep throat, lots of times they refer to that as scarlet fever. Uh, headache, nausea, vomiting, and swollen and tender lymph nodes. In with the malt, this is going to be found, remember, we talked about within especially the um, digestive system, the respiratory system, and reproductive and urinary systems. These are going to be what these sections look like that line those areas. And so you see that in their intestinal for this section, so it's going to be stomach, or intestines. You see the lining there. You see the germinal center of the cells, and there's where you're going to have your lymphoid nodules. So this is going to be where these microorganisms will be taken to be destroyed by the phagocytic cells that are going to be found in this area. Primary lymphatic organs are going to be where immune cells become immunocompetent. Becoming immunocompetent means that they are taught basically what to attack, what not to attack, and how to do their job. So the cells are first going to be made in the red bone marrow with the other blood cells. And so that's where you're going to find your white blood cells being made or your lymphatic cells. Then they're going to go to the thymus to become immunocompetent. And this is going to be your T cells. The thymus is going to be a gland that hangs slightly over the top portion of the heart. So it'd be found in the center of the chest, what's referred to as mediastinum. And it is very, very active in infants and young children. And as you get older, it starts to go into atrophy. So by the time you're in your mid twenties to thirties, it's gone into atrophy completely and it doesn't function as well. Secondary lymphatic organs are gonna be things such as lymph nodes, the spleen, and lymphatic nodules. So here you see a picture of the spleen. That spleen is going to be important in helping to filter out these different microorganisms as well. Going into how the um, lymphatic cells are going to be formed first, like we said, they're going to be formed in the red bone marrow. You have one group of stem cells that's going to be remaining there in that red bone marrow, and it produces daughter cells that mature into natural killer cells and B cells. So you have that hemocytoblast, and it can differentiate into the lymphoid stem cells, or it could go from the lymphoid stem cell to the thymus, where it's going to make the T cells. If it stays there at the red bone marrow, think of that as B, so bone marrow B thymus T. So the B cells are going to actually go and once they are introduced or they are um, exposed to interleukin-7, they are going to differentiate into the natural killer cells or the B cells. They're going to enter in through the bloodstream and then they're going to migrate to peripheral tissues where they're going to be able to do their job. So if it's a natural killer cell, it's going to attack foreign cells, body cells that could have viruses or body cells that may have cancers. And the way it does this is it's going to actually poke holes in the cell membrane of that cell. Now, as it destroys the cell membrane in that cell, that's going to cause that cell to lice or to break up into parts. If it is a B cell, that's going to be an antibody mediated cell or immunity cell. 
it's going to turn in from a B cell to a plasma cell. That plasma cell is then going to start to secrete antibodies. And antibodies have that little Y shape there. And they're going to go out in search of antigens that will be found on outside of microorganisms that they are in search of to attack. So each microorganism has a specific antigen on its cell membrane. And these antibodies will go out in search of that specific antigen in order to attach to it to cause it to be destroyed. All right. So if it is a T cell coming on over, it migrates to the thymus. From there, it's going to mature and become immunocompetent. Once it matures and becomes immunocompetent, it's then going to enter into the bloodstream. From there, it can become what's known as a cytotoxic T cell. That's going to be one type of T cell. It's going to play a role in cell mediated immunity. They will attack and destroy foreign cells or body cells that might be infected with viruses and cause them to lyse and break up into parts, which then will be absorbed by phagocytic cells. Okay, so we're going to stop right there and we're going to pick up with the next section on immunity.